Did you know that every second, three new smartphone users come online for the first time? Hi, I'm Tracy, a lead researcher on the Next Billion Users team. And I'm Neha, a product strategist on the Next Billion Users team. Tracy and I work together across all of Google to ensure our products are inclusively built for new internet users, people who are just starting to use the World Wide Web. Let's kick off with an activity that will help us all see with fresh eyes. Neha, do you want to try to gorm the zop? Sure. Okay, in this interface, you have 10 seconds to find your friend. Ready, go. Time's up. How did that feel? It was quite confusing. I didn't know what it was saying to me or where to tap. Neha, you are not alone. We've run this activity with thousands of Googlers. Common feelings that surfaced were frustration, embarrassment, and confusion. Here are some quotes. Everything looked foreign. It gave me bad feedback. I had to memorize what to do. We even had someone reach out to us and say, hey, your website is broken. Perfect responses, because they all closely mirror what someone with low digital literacy feels when they first come online and try using technology products. Low digital literacy exists globally. A 2016 study across 33 countries showed that just 5% of the adult population have high computer-related skills. And in 2018, the Digital Empowerment Foundation reported that they consider 90% of India to be digitally non-literate. While the exact numbers and measurement methods vary, they all indicate that much of the population is lacking the digital literacy required to complete basic tasks. The most extreme user type to represent this are who we call new internet users. People who come online in the millions each and every day, primarily on smartphones, in regions like Asia Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. New internet users are changing the landscape of the internet and digital technology. They face different constraints than what tech creators are used to, like patchy connectivity, limited digital experience, low literacy, and low digital confidence. For the past three years, we've been researching the digital journeys of new internet users in Brazil, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Mexico. Something that may surprise you, the geography doesn't matter as much as people typically think. Across all these regions, new internet users showed very similar behaviors. And new internet users don't just exist in these five countries, they exist everywhere. That's because human needs are universal, no matter the context. What's exciting is when you build products with an understanding of the constraints and context that the most extreme users, like new internet users face, the result is a product that is more relevant and helpful for everyone. This is why we see new internet users sparking a paradigm shift and how to build effective global products. As some of the earliest creators and adopters of the internet, it might be hard for people in the tech industry to understand that what seems obvious to us can actually be frustrating and demotivating for many users around the globe. The first step is acknowledging the gap in comfort levels in using technology. The second is to see the similarities in our needs. Turning to the internet to solve a problem, connect with a loved one, finish a task, or just have some fun. Things both experienced and new internet users want to do. We've found that there are principles inspired by new internet users that lead to product improvements that ultimately benefit everyone. Today, we'll explore three principles for how to build more globally relevant products. Principle number one, Prioritize voice interactions. Principle number two, be visual forward. Principle number three, focus on upboarding, not just onboarding. Principle number one, prioritize voice interactions. 
Typing is hard, and the keyboard is one of the most intimidating items that pops up in a new internet user's experience. Voice enables new internet users to overcome literacy barriers and engage with apps in a way that feels familiar and fast. Voice interactions are actually three times faster than typing, especially for multilingual users. Reliable, consistent voice interactions are helpful for a wide range of people, not just new internet users. Imagine you're driving and need to pull up directions. Using your voice to ask Google Maps helps keep your hands on the wheel and eyes on the road. Or perhaps you're baking and your hands are covered in flour. Being able to set a timer with your voice keeps food off your devices. We've invested heavily in this space across many of our products. A recent example of how we've built upon voice interactions is through language options in the Google Assistant. In India, where many people are multilingual, users can now set a different language just for speaking to the Google Assistant without the need to change their OS language. The team even took it a step further so users can switch between 32 languages on their phone with just their voice by asking, OK, Google, Bangla Bolo, or talk to me in Bangla. Another part of prioritizing voice is making it work similar to human interaction through multilingual queries. For mixed language queries, we are working on models that help us better understand user intent. For example, if a user says, Dili se jalandar ki train kab start hogi, it doesn't matter that it's a mix of English and Hindi. We know they are asking when the train will leave from Delhi to Jalandar. So remember to prioritize voice interactions throughout your product experience, especially for key functions. This ultimately creates a better, more seamless experience for everyone, reflecting the ubiquitous nature of voice. Principle number two, be visual forward. Visuals are an important way to communicate within your product and help users navigate. But the effectiveness of that communication is dependent on how clear your visuals are. Standalone symbols or icons that are too abstract don't always translate culturally and can be confusing. We've seen that visuals that are based on real life actions and are semi-abstract tend to communicate best. Visuals are also important because many new internet users are considered low literate, functionally literate, or non-literate. Text is yet another barrier standing in the way of people unlocking the value of the internet. And visuals don't just help with low literate users. There are many examples of content that's just easier to understand visually. For example, we have all had to relearn how to wash our hands properly over the last year. Or if you had to assemble furniture, cut your hair, or learn how to play a board game. Wouldn't you prefer visuals over text? This is why instruction manuals often have lots of images. Plus, considering how overstimulated users are in this digital era, imagery, animations, videos, and more can cut through the noise more effectively than text strings. Several examples can be seen with Google Lens. First, the Lens product is inherently visual. Images are the input, no text or voice query formation required. And the output is either multiple image results or an altered version of the original image. Here, you can see the translate feature in action. Lens affects just the words in the image, but keeps the surrounding context undisturbed. This de-abstracts this sophisticated feature and makes it easy for new users to understand. New internet users often call this feature like magic. Second, now lens features are also represented by more concrete icons. For example, we recently redesigned the listen icon. Previously, it looked like this. Even though the copy below said listen, users thought that tapping the icon would play a video instead of reading the text within the image out loud. We explored many iterations of a new design conducted qualitative and quantitative research with new internet users, and found that a more semi-abstract icon worked better for comprehension. The final result was actually more clear for all users, 
So we have rolled this out to other touch points beyond Lens in Google Go. Another example can be seen in Google Chrome. Chrome is experimenting with query tiles to help suggest topics or subject areas. Instead of leaning into text or very abstract graphics, the team incorporated photographic imagery. This helped ensure comprehension and also made it easier and faster to see the range of queries one could try. Remember, leveraging well-designed visuals can help you efficiently and effectively communicate with your users throughout the product experience, regardless of their comfort reading text. Principle number three, focus on upboarding, not just onboarding. Onboarding, while important, is often front-loaded, usability-focused, and assumes that the user already knows the general purpose of an app. But this can't be assumed anymore. Think of all the things a new internet user is taking in at once. New concepts, navigation models, icons, text, different input mechanisms. It's cognitive overload, and traditional onboarding doesn't help the situation. If you focus on upboarding and onboarding, you communicate the relevant value of your product, not just how to use it. With upboarding, educational moments happen in context, not all at once upon the first opening, and they only disrupt an experience when critical. Also with upboarding, learning materials don't disappear, but are always available since people learn at different paces. A great example of onboarding and upboarding in action is within Camera Go. When someone first uses Camera Go, they are greeted with animated onboarding tutorials to help them understand features like translate mode or portrait mode. Later on in the experience, there are signals to help educate the user on additional features and complex concepts as they encounter them. For example, as the user takes photos, there is a color-coded reminder of how many more photos can be captured based on their device's available storage. As the storage decreases, this signal becomes more prominent. When tapped, the user can learn more about the amount of storage available, and they can even create more storage through the Files app linked within the Camera Go experience. This teaches users that phones have limited storage and that photos take up that space. We often see that this concept is not well understood and people lose out on capturing key moments due to a full storage. This concept of upboarding helps prevent that error and teaches a key concept at the same time. Every second, three new smartphone users come online for the first time from around the world, and they are eager to use technology. But to enable new internet users into becoming future power users of technology, we need to create products that are both relevant to their needs and usable in their context. If we can leave you with even just one thing to remember, this is it. When you build for new internet users, you ultimately build better for everyone. These are just a few best practices and examples of how you can effectively build for new internet users. There are many more best practices to share, such as building with data and storage in mind, or building for diversity of language. So if you'd like to learn more, please visit nextbillionusers.google. You'll find more insights, case studies, and materials. Additionally, you'll find a digital confidence toolkit developed in partnership with IDEO and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This toolkit dives even deeper into these specific best practices and provides materials so that you can run your own design sprints. It's a great resource and tool to put these principles into action. Thank you. <laughs>